Lord, thank you for this crazy group of people. <laughs> they could have stayed home where it's cool, and instead they decided to come out here to, oh, sorry, my phone's trying to, and I wasn't talking to you. And Father, thank you for how your spirit is moving here, and we honor you, spirit. Imprint on us whatever you want to do. Because, Lord, so often it feels like I'm just a hot mess and so is whatever I prepare. But you have it. And so you make it yours or just throw it away. To the glory of Jesus. Amen. Hey, everybody. How you doing? Good to see you all. More of you showed up when we started to worship. I have a habit. I close my eyes when I worship so that I'm not distracted by seeing all your beautiful faces, right? Some more beautiful than others, some even more distracting for the wrong reason, but anyway, okay. No, it's just kind of fun. I open up my eyes and there's all these other people there. It's like, okay, cool. God's multiplying the fish and the loaves, so I'll let you figure out which one you are. But anyway, live large or die small. The bride's tipping point, ascend or descend, be drenched or dried out. Okay, so... Most of you know, but some of you don't, so we'll just realign quickly. One of the things we do when we dig deep into the Word is we align with God in time. And in his first month, the big deal is about Passover, the crucifixion, resurrection. When you move forward, the third big month is Pentecost. And what happens on Mount Sinai with the Lord speaking on the mountain, the Ten Commandments, all of that, but also what happens in Jerusalem at Mount Zion. And then the seventh month, which is tabernacles, when the Lord's glory ascends in a, just a new way, descends and, and rests with us and we dwell with it. And so we understand from, I understand what revelation that God gave me, that this really is an annual covenant cycle for us. That the first feast is so much about leaving Okay, a man shall leave his father and mother, a woman leave her home, shall cleave to her husband, the two shall become one flesh. So there's always more where we've got to leave. We've got to leave things behind. Would you agree? Okay. And there's always deeper ways in which we need to cleave and connect, and then always more in ways in which we become one. And so God uses these, and he said very clearly in Leviticus, these are my appointed times. And elsewhere he said, no one is to come empty-handed, and because of that, it's it's about when we're right here that there is actually a divine transaction that's supposed to happen, okay? And while it's the Feast of Pentecost, and that happened last week, we're, we're still in that month, and there's a lot of things that we kind of mine out from that, okay? That word was about mining more, and man, I love to dig into the word and do that. Sometimes it's a challenge um, because I get, it, I get it here, right? Have you ever had that where you kind of know something down here? And then you have to try to figure out how to get it up and out. So we're going to try to do it from there. But these divine transactions are there because there really are divine tipping points. Those three big feasts right there with these transactions have each of them have a divine tipping point because God shows up and changes things. Okay. And so they become then decision points that we have to make going forward or not. And you go back to the crucifixion, right? Lots of people made decisions at that point. Pentecost has another, Tabernacles has a third. But it really comes down to a lot of ways between what the known and the throne. Do you know what I mean by that? Wait a minute, this is always the way we've done it. Wait a minute, God, we've never done it that way before. So it's always about the known versus the throne. Because the throne shows up, Jehovah's Sneaky, comes in and he just goes, okay, watch this, right? And again and again and again, we see it in scripture, how it just stuns the people. He's still doing it. So you say known versus throne. Known. Okay. That is a challenge for everyone here, correct? You get used to a certain way. You like the habit. It's kind of comfortable, right? You, you get, there's a culture of comfort that becomes very seductive. Oh, I'm always used to this. God always does this. God never does that. And that becomes our known. And suddenly God shows up with a throne and it tips the scales. Because bottom line, his finger is on the scale and he's weighing things down. 
And one of the key verses in this is from 1 Kings 18, when Elijah is confronting the people of Israel and says, how long will you falter between two opinions? In other words, are you going to deal with the known or are you going to deal with the throne? You okay with that? Say, I'm going to receive the throne. Okay. Okay, so let's just hit on a couple of things here. Because this happens this month in time. Now when all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mo mountain smoking, the people were afraid and trembled and they stood far off and said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us lest we die. Okay, well, and Christy's shaking her head, but I will guarantee you that if God right now started rumbling and things started on fire and everything else, a lot of you would just head right out that door. You would not fall on your knees and worship. You'd be go, oh, crap, I'm out of here, right? <laughs> Again, known versus throne. When God shows up, okay? Universal experience, exposure to an angel in scripture is what? <laughs> Fear, right? Because the thing they always have to say is what? Don't be afraid. Or in current vernacular, stop freaking out. <laughs> Chill, okay? It's okay. So they do that. Moses said to the people, do not fear for God has come to what? test you, that the fear of him may be before you, and that you may not sin. In other words, God will show up throne-wise in order to shake us in a good way, that we remember who he is. The people stood far off while Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. So one of the keys that are in here is this contrast, because one of the things that you have going on is Moses ascending. How often does Moses ascend up the mountain? Do you know? One time, two times, three times. Do I hear four, 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 four? I got five in the background, five, 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 five. Okay. Well, actually, the total number of times that scripture talks about him ascending is eight different times. There's a persistence in him ascending. Okay. That eight times, and bottom line underneath it is this decision to go wherever God is. And by the way, there is risk and reward. Okay? Hebrews brings this quote. So terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I'm exceedingly afraid and trembling. Y you have to get that it's not that Moses wasn't afraid. <laughs> okay? Okay. <laughs> but that he was willing to ascend into where, right, where the action was, in with what God is up to. And that thing about ascending in this month is critical. Do you all here have a choice to ascend or not? Okay. How do you ascend? Worship is one of those ways. How else? How did, how did Moses ascend? How did Moses ascend? By going down, okay, by humbling himself, okay? I mean, literally, he walked, right? <laughs> he walked into where the presence was, yeah? Sometimes you got to walk where the presence is, folks, okay? And boy, for me, sometimes it's out in nature. You, I, I go out in nature and stuff, and I see animals and stuff, and it's just like, <gasps> I don't know, it, it does something in me, right? The presence, because it's just, I'm just very aware. Sometimes you got to walk into where the presence is. Don't get always religious about this, okay? Now, it may appear for you that presence in a sanctuary, okay? There's some gorgeous sanctuaries, and the presence of God can really reside there. But where does he meet you, and what do you need to do to ascend? Okay, because to ascend means that you're leaving something behind. And that's the big key. Moses couldn't ascend and stay in the middle of all those folks. Okay. And that ascending is real key in so many places in Scripture. John in Revelation, after these things I looked and behold, a door standing open in heaven. The first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me saying, come up here and I will show you things which must take place after that. Part of the issue of, of Pentecost in that time is this dynamic about an open heaven. Say open heaven. Amen. Part of what we believe is that God has put time stamps tied the calendar, his biblical calendar, specific events, because he would like us to focus upon those in that time. Hello? 
not because of any just arbitrary thing, but because he's working in that same way again. Okay? Not that he can't do it other times, but he highlights it and says, look, there's an open heaven now, Janet. Step into it. Step up. Okay? This is the time when Moses, uh, he ascended, and he had to be persistent eight times. Okay? Going up, going up. Don't get discouraged. Oh, God, every time I try to connect, I just kind of fall flat. Okay, well, come up higher. Come up higher, and I will show you things. And the challenge is, is you can ascend or what? Or descend. And what happens on the bottom of the mountain is that very thing. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together with Aaron and said to him, Up, make us gods who shall go before us. Now, that event doesn't actually happen until the next month, but we're in the time now when Moses had ascended and they start doing this. Hello? If you don't ascend up, then typically we descend into something else. And what they descend into is making an idol, right? Coming up with something that will comfort them. They aren't willing to submit to the throne, so they go back to what? The known. Oh, this is what we knew back in Egypt. It worked. So we're just going to connect those two things. So, you know, the question of whether you're ascending or descending, it's really is a binary choice, folks. Hello. Penny hit this when she was talking about what's going on. Either you're advancing or you're going back. You are not going to be allowed to just stand still in this time. It is what it is, folks. You make a decision. You're going up because if not, trust me, what's happening? And particularly in the cultural climate that you're in now and all the pressure and all the crazy, you really have, what's going to happen to you if you stay in that, right? You just, the more you soak in it, it's just like wearing cement galoshes and trying to go out in the water. Yeah? Okay. So in this time when the Lord comes and they hear the voice of God and he releases the word of God and it's about the presence of God, there is this tipping point that the people of God have to get to. Okay. The people heard God's voice. Yes or no? Okay. But it was Moses who embraced it. Right. So often we don't want, no, 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 I don't want to, I don't want to hear that. No, 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 no. Moses ascends, they descend, he enters the presence, and they seek to avoid it. Tipping point. Now, this is for the bride of Christ as well. I believe we're at, again, another tipping point right now. Because God is bringing certain things into focus. And the question is, will the bride ascend or not? How's that for a picture? Very cool, huh? The bride has to decide, ascend into the presence or descend into the pressure. And there is risk and reward in either place, but she can't just stay hanging out on the ledge. She's going to have to go up or down. Just telling you all, make a decision, go up or go down. Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King Jr., Martin Luther, former, you know, founder of Lutheranism and the Protestant Reformation and all that, right? Got sick and tired of people doing these little piddly ways of sinning, right? Trying to ignore and be disobedient. So he just said, if you sin, sin boldly. Stop farting around, pretend that everything's fine. You're going to be in rebellion, then at least stand there and say it. Don't try to be subtle about it, right? Go up. Or go down. Can't just stand in one place. Okay. Another, you get that? That makes sense. One of those tipping points in this time. The other is is about this really scary concept of the Holy Spirit, right? It's another tipping point where you have the question between the known and the throne. And how do we get that? Well, of course, what happens in Acts chapter two? Holy Spirit shows up, scares the snot out of a whole lot of people. Okay. You can go to the second Pentecost, by the way, which is at Cornelius' house. Okay? Peter's preaching to them. They're Gentiles. 
He's not even quite sure why he's there other than he knows he's supposed to. In the middle of that conversation and preaching, he doesn't even get to the punchline, doesn't get an altar call in, doesn't close the deal, and suddenly the Holy Spirit shows up and they all start speaking in tongues. The known versus the throne. The throne comes in and Peter goes, oh, wow, okay. Well, I guess we better baptize these folks. <laughs> yeah. Of course, he gets what? He gets called on the carpet into Jerusalem. What the hell are you thinking? <laughs> Baptizing Gentiles. He's like, okay, I know that's the known, but this is the throne. And he showed up and he did it. Jehovah Sneaky strikes again. But the spirit in this time um, comes in dynamics. And it's another tipping point. And one of the things that Jesus points out is about... Before he's, he goes in John 14, he says, The spirit of truth is coming, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him or knows him. It's very interesting, right? He talks about the world, and yet a good part of the church can be this way. I don't really see him or know him. So that's kind of, anyway. But let's just, just touch on a couple of things that are real important to remember. When was the spirit promised? Well, in John 14, Jesus says the spirit of truth lives with you as in him, but he will be in you. Okay. So the promise of the spirit was given right there, but then there's this other part, which is the fullness on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, if anyone is thirst, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me as the scripture has said out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But he spoke this concerning the spirit whom those believing in him would receive for the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified, right? So we have these two instances are promised and then we see these two points when it's released. So Jesus says he was with you, but he'll be in you. And after he is raised from the dead in John 20, he says, peace to you as the father has sent me. So I also send you. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Yeah. So anchor pointed back with Ephesians one, when you believed, say, when you believed, when you believed. okay. You are marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession. Yeah. Have you got the seal? Yeah, you got the seal, right? Everybody got the seal. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's straightforward. You believe him. You received that promised seal, the Holy Spirit. You are sealed. But there's more, right? Oh, but that's what's known. Okay, what about the throne? Well, then there's this alternative. <laughs> because the question is, if that was the giving of the Spirit, when was the fullness? Okay. When was it released? When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. So you got sealed, but then you got this, which I would call soaked. Right? Absolutely saturated. And so every believer has the spirit, right? This is, this is where sometimes the church falls apart. Every believer has the spirit and you have to honor that. But not everybody has received that saturation, that fullness, because there's a choice with it, right? Jesus appeared to more than 500 at one time. And yet in the upper room where this thing happens, there's only 120. So even right there, we know. There's folks who just go, nah. And the reality is the Holy Spirit shows up to work and to bring what he does. But a lot of times we're not soaked. We're just frankly annoyed. <laughs> yeah. But we're again at a tipping point for the bride. Okay. And it's brought back front and center again, because this is the month when God says, this is the feast of Pentecost. This is when I showed up on Mount Sinai and I spoke to the people. They heard my voice. I gave my word. Um, Moses ascended into my presence and they descended down into religion. Right? Because that's what that was. Will we be soaked? 
And you know, when I was preparing this, I'm going, Lord, Lord I'm just, I'm preaching to the choir though. Most of these folks have been thoroughly soaked. And he just spoke and said, not as much as I can give them. However much you think you've moved in, been saturated by the Holy Spirit, there's more, right? Was talking on the prison on Tuesday about this and trying to help them understand, guys, you all have the spirit. You all have that seal. It's there. But that's also about the amount of space that a lot of you give the Holy Spirit to operate. He's there, but that's, that's what he gets. It's kind of like in their language, you put him in solitary confinement. Yeah, you, know, you put him in the hole, cut off from everybody else and isolated and just kind of can do there. When you decide you want more, you give him access, okay? You give him access and he'll just say, I'll take it all, right? He'll take all the room. So all of that leads again to just this very simple question, which most of you would know right away. What are you? Okay. Are you a body that has a spirit or you are spirit contained in a body? Okay. I hear you talking. I see your lips moving, but is that actually how you live? Do you really live as a spirit contained in a body or do you live more like a body that has a spirit? I think it's the former, frankly, for this reason. If you look at the, the care and feeding what do you do to strengthen your body? How often do you feed it? How often do you rest it? How often do you exercise it? If you want to sit down and just do the rough math of how much time you invest in the body, including then cleaning it up, <laughs> waking it up, stimulating it with caffeine and anything else you can get right and all this other kind of stuff. Would you agree? Tremendous... So if somebody just watched, they'd go, well, you're a body who's got a spirit. Because frankly, all your time, energy, and attention seems to go into that. No? I'm just asking. And so here's the other question then on the other side, then how much time, how do you strengthen your spirit? How often do you feed it? How often do you rest it? And how often do you exercise it? And folks, just you know, a couple hours a week somewhere ain't gonna cut it. And don't, again, get overly religious, please. Okay? Don't, the word's critically important. You need to feed off the word, right? But what is God doing to stir things up in you? You can go see a movie with God and he'll speak to you profoundly through that movie. Okay? You can take a walk somewhere. You can be having a great meal and enjoying a glass of wine and it can be like, wow. But are you really enjoying it and present with it, with God in the spirit? Or are you just slamming it down? Is your prayer time really connecting with him? Or is it just a menu list of wishes? Again, I was talking to the guys inside. Can you imagine a lot of them have kids? So can you imagine your kid coming and going, hey, dad, good to see you. By the way, I need this. I need this. I need this. I need this. Thanks. How would you deal with a kid on that? Now, you want to help them with those things, but that wouldn't be very effective. It's not what you want from them. You, you want connection. How are you? What's going on? Talk, connect. Yeah. So, saved? Yes. Sealed? Yes. The question, though, is saturated or not? So, there's this whole issue about what is within us. You're tracking that, right? Okay. The other, though, is about this deepening rhythm. Um, if you got the ping, I concluded a passage there in Ezekiel. You know what chapter? Oh, how many of you read it? Ah, a few of you. Okay. Okay. John did, see? And, you know, good. Okay. Newcomer, and he read it. He gets bonus points. This is when Ezekiel is being shown around the temple and 
the angel takes him to a place and he sees this water coming out from under the temple. And when the man went out to the east with a line in his hand, he measured 1,000 cubits and he brought me to the waters. The water came up to my ankles. Again, he measured 1,000 and brought me through the waters. The water came up to my knees and he measured 1,000 and brought me through. The water came up to my waist. Again, he measured 1,000. It was a river that I could not cross for the water was too deep. Water in which one must swim, a river that could not be crossed. This is all about, right, the water is, is representative of the spirit. How deep do you get in? And what's interesting, you know, each one of those measurements of 1,000 cubits, do you know how far that is? It's about 1,500 feet, okay? So figure five football fields, okay? So, yeah, he's got to take him, there's a journey between this. The water gets deeper the further they go. Remember, Moses had to walk. <laughs> there's a journey here, hello? Oh, God, I want it deep and I want it now. God's like, okay. Will you walk with me then? Right? Question is whether we're willing to walk deep enough to where we'll go in when we can't touch bottom. Tipping point. Stay on the shore. Ankle deep. A lot of ankle deep folks. They look a lot like that guy that was frustrated with the mist all over his glasses. Okay, this is just sort of inconvenient. Okay, yeah, because you got to go all the way in, right? Half baked kind of gets you half. So in a sense, there are really kind of two rivers. There's one that we get in and there's one that flows out of us. Does that make sense? Okay. So here's the thing. Can you see him? <laughs> Live large or die small. I want to give you a couple other verses out of that passage in Ezekiel 47 that are kind of amazing. Everything will live wherever the river goes. You need to, everything will live wherever the river goes. You're in the river and the river's coming out of you everywhere. And then later on is this, they will bear fruit every month because their water flows from the sanctuary. You, you getting this? Hello. Okay. So you live large in the spirit or frankly, you die small in the flesh. You ascend or you descend folks. And when you ascend, you start living large in the spirit. When you descend, you start dying out in the flesh because that's what's left down there. That's at the bottom of the hill. That's all the pressure on air. And that's the calf. That's the, all the other stuff that happens. It's one or the other. Here, I got my seal. I got my token. Yes, indeed you do. And it's like a defibrillator. And that someday when you're dead and in the ground and the Lord comes, boom, you will be brought to life, right? And raised from the dead. Question is, what about between now and when you do die? And do you want more than a defibrillator? You want to be soaked. Okay. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Yeah, you know that. This is about getting into that freedom. He says, it is for freedom that Christ has set you free. Therefore, do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. A yoke of slavery is getting back into religion and stuff like that. It's living smaller and smaller and smaller. About two weeks ago, maybe two and a half, I, was, I got a devotion uh, via email from John Eldridge, the author. I mean, you get that, the Wild Heart, okay? And he said something just real passing in there about penguins. And I just it just triggered something in me. And so... If you look at penguins a lot, this is kind of how you see them, right? And if you think about how they move, this is kind of it. Okay, right? I mean, that, this is standard fare, right? These, these emperor penguins, by the way, weigh about 80 pounds, okay? They ain't small, and one-third of that is blubber, okay? Now, there's others. Once they get rolling and they're in a pack, they can move a little bit faster, Frankly, that's sped up, but they still look pretty ridiculous, right? So these penguins are considered flightless birds, right? Because those little appendages, you can see them using them for a little balance. Didn't work so well on the top. 
but on the bottom, at least they're getting going. They're flightless, they're awkward, they're slow, and frankly, they're pretty comical, right? Okay. That's generally the opinion of penguins until you see them in the water. Okay. When they are just like greased lightning and they can just, this is when they ascend out of the water and shoot off and 80 pounds of penguin that looks so puddly on the surface suddenly get airborne, literally, right? But how they move through the water, how quickly they move around. And so they're very in fluid, they're fast, they're elegant, and they're incredibly free, right? Gone is all that encumbrance of this. Hello. So... They're designed to actually move in two different worlds. But they have to go into the depths to get what they need. But it's also a place of danger, right? It's where the food is. It's also where certain seals and sharks are, okay? So they've gotta be smart about it. But they cannot survive in only one environment. They actually have to go back and forth in order to exist. And they have to know how to effectively move back and forth between the two. So this interesting contrast and comparison, right? They are created to live in two worlds and the fact of the matter is, so are we. The, the question is just, what world are you going to let be the driver and controller? You know, because we are, we are a spirit in a body and we are designed to live in both worlds. Yeah. And you got to go into the depths because the great strength and freedom is found in the depths. Okay. And it's also where a large part of the warfare has to be waged and fought. Yeah. Another quick thing, I, I can't show clips in there because streaming thing, we buy I buy licenses for video clips and stuff that I show other settings, but when you live stream it out, it changes all the rules. So anyway, I just have to substitute with this. But anyway, how many of you seen Aquaman? About six or so, not many of you. Okay, anyway, bottom line, it's a story about a, a man and a woman He's just a normal guy. He's a lighthouse keeper. She happens to be an Atlantean from the lost city of Atlantis, right? And they fall in love and they have a kid. And this kid is just thinks he's normal. But what's interesting, this is him at an aquarium. It turns out that the, the, the animals that are in the aquarium recognize something about him. Okay. At one point he's getting beat roughed up by a couple of, of guys and the shark comes banging into the glass to defend him. And it just backs the big guys out and he, and he turns around, just puts his hand out and, and the shark just kind of mellows. And it's an amazing scene. And later on, he still doesn't understand though, that he's got this dual identity, right? that he can move in two worlds. And it's only when he's about this age that he gets a mentor and he's shown he can do more than just swim. He can swim incredibly fast. He can talk, communicate in that atmosphere, okay? He can leap, he's, his eyes adjust, his body can deal with the pressure. And so it's an interesting metaphor in the same way about someone who has been created to live in two worlds. And there's this fascinating line because there's problems going down, problems underneath the sea. So this woman comes out to get him back and he doesn't, to, to rule, he's actually part of royalty because his mother was a queen in Atlantis. And he keeps arguing that he can't go back. And she says, you think you're unworthy to rule because you come from two different worlds. That's exactly why you are worthy. You got to get this, folks. You have to understand. Jesus was the son of God and the son of man. Lived in two. You understand. Had both. He was the first fruits. Firstborn of many of which we have been grafted in now. Okay. That dual nature. This, this line is amazing. 
okay? You are supposed to rule and reign for the kingdom, not for yourself, not with your head knowledge, but for the kingdom, okay? You're supposed to administer. Make sense? Okay, so this is that scene in the aquarium. It's just an amazing scene when all after those bullies back off and then all the all the fish just come up there and just sort of align with him and it just reminded me of this passage from roman creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of god do we get that the enemy clearly knows and is scared of who you are but he's mainly scared that you would come to understand who you are because frankly if you don't know it then it's less it's, it's a potential this is not a big deal. Oh, I got my seal. Okay. Okay, that's great. Good. Right? He gets worried about those that are saturated. Because they're the ones that are going to end up, okay. Jesus said, he who believes in me will do the works that I do and even greater works. Really do. So, like him, you are more than flesh, blood, mind, and emotions. You are a spirit with a temporary body. Say, I am a spirit. I, I think, again, I think we can say that, folks. I think we can say that, but I don't think we get it. I do not think we get it. C.S. Lewis said in uh, The Weight of Glory, you've never met a mere mortal in your life. Because every created person has a spirit, and that spirit is immortal. To one destiny or the other. But it is immortal. It is designed to live forever. Okay. That's a really scary thing in some ways. Okay. But like those penguins were amphibious, designed to live in two environments, and were actually pretty clumsy in one environment and amazing in the other. And if you're not sure about that, go and try to do something good and Christian when it's not being moved by the Spirit. Go try to share Jesus with someone when you're not being prompted by the Lord to do that. And just watch the wheels come off. Right? Hello? Yep. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> and then we fall down. Okay? You get, you get in the spirit, it's a very different motion. So the question is, where are you hanging out? What has priority? And will you live large out of the spirit or not? So part of this is a question, and you are the bride. Say, I am the bride. I am the bride. Yeah. So will the bride ascend and attend to the presence of God? Will she be soaked and saturated? And will she live absolutely large? Will we waddle? Or soar? Will we live large or die small? I'm, I'm very serious about this, folks, okay? Again, I was, I was talking with these guys. I, I don't know if we say kind of similar things there to here, but was talking with them. Guys, you, you have to learn to live large in the spirit. They're, they're in their cell blocks now, right? They are, there's no air conditioning, just so we're clear. No air, okay? And they're two-story. They're the cinder blocks. The guys who have the hardest time are on the second floor. There's two floors on the second floor where the, the cinder block, where the sun sets that way on the west, if they got a Western one, because then that center block just heats up. Now, some of them will have fans. And so they put a fan at the, you know, head of the bed and just try to sleep. But even then, it's often just blowing hot air. Okay. So when I, I have to make sure that I'm, you know, you, you can't be throwing little tidbits. You, you have to be right. It's got to be real. How many of you know Jerry, uh, Johnny Erickson Tata? Beautiful young woman, diving accident, quadriplegic. No movement from the neck down. And has created incredible art, right? Draws with her using, holding things in her mouth. 
and speaks. She has a radio show. I don't know if it's still going on, but she always introduces it by reading this verse. This great, this light and momentary affliction is preparing for us a weight of glory. And every time I hear it, I go, oh, crap, I can't even, you know, I was like, oh, you know, what I'm saying is like, and I share this with these guys because I said she lives large in the spirit, okay? Because she has to. And I'm trying to encourage them. What else have you got to do here? You can't, you're going to die small if this is your life. You're going to have to live large. You're going to have to live more and more by the spirit. You're going to have to choose to be like that penguin hits the water and just floats and free. Because in the spirit, that is true, regardless of what's happening around you physically. And, you know, a number of these guys are in their late 20s and they're in for life without parole. You know, so they are for me an example I have to go, okay, practice what you preach, Johnson. But there is this question, whether or not we're going to, you know, or are we going to live large? Okay, no, no, you're going to remember this, right? You're going to remember this, the, the, the waddle. Some of you are going to leave this way. There, do, you, do you understand how many of you have been in the spirit where you know that, that, since I mean, you operated in that, right? Yeah, there's a place. Athletes will call it being in the flow, okay? When things just, just move, okay? I've been in that in training, different uh, sports that I've trained in. There's times you just get in the groove and you don't even have to think. You're just, you're, just, you're just moving and by the spirit. But that is going to take regular exposure and going into the depth. Not ankle. Not knee, not waist. Oh, we're to head. Okay. So, is this making sense? Okay. Some practical help. Next week at the deck, um, Kim's going to teach. It's going to be a shorter word because then we're going to do, we have a, a good sized pool out here and we baptize people before. And so we're going to open it up for baptisms. And what it is, is we want, for those of you who would like to baptize you into the new day. Okay. Just so we're clear. By the way, there's some people, oh, we shouldn't be baptized a second time. Most of those people who are often good Bible-based people and stuff do great with that until they go to Israel. And then they all want to be baptized in the Jordan. <laughs> well, that's different because that's where Jesus did it. Okay, well, okay. I mean, right. So you're not getting baptized unto salvation, okay, but you are coming in the new day. And what happens when you go under, let me just tell you about the way that I do it. It's a little bit different. Um, Paul talks very clearly. I'll talk a little bit more about this next week that when we are baptized, we enter into the death of Jesus. Okay. So how long was D Jesus in the grave for? Okay. So when you come to get baptized, we hold you down for three days. <laughs> we don't do that, but I do this. I bring you down. And I let you stay down as long as you want to. And then you tap my finger when you want me to bring you up. For this reason, you need to understand this is about dying to what was. You, you have to get this. This this tea bag dunk like this. I'm sorry, you don't even do a tea bag like that. You put the tea bag in. Otherwise, there's no flavor, right? You, you got to get down there. And we've had one lady in here who is deathly afraid, didn't know how to swim, deathly afraid of water. Let me tell you, for her, that was a real baptism. <laughs> really was, because she was frightened. And for her to get over that fear, to trust Kim and I enough to lay her down in the water and then come up. And so it's completely up to you. If you want to get baptized, don't want to get baptized. It's, But this is a practical help. Sometimes for you to go deeper, you got to break off the old stuff and come up into the new day. And we had one lady that we, we put down under there, and she said as soon as she hit the water, this song, this 50s song, hit the road, Jack. 
I don't want you back no more. She, because she was getting delivered. Stuff was coming off of her when she hit the water. Okay? That foul stuff. So just for some of you, just, just know that God will do deliverance in those times. Okay? You go under the water and stuff will fly out of there because it's scared to death of going in the place you're going. Do you understand? Entering into the death of that. And then we bring you back up. So a couple of things, if you'd like to do that, obviously bring a change of clothes. Okay. Um, I, well, depending on how many people are, we may or may not have enough towels. So you might want to do that because just standing out there buck naked with a blow dryer doesn't work so well. <laughs> Try that too. But the other thing is just, if you would just let us know that you want to do that so we kind of have an idea. But we'll do this and we'll go outside there and, uh, you know, the pool water will be a little too warm, frankly. It'll be more like bath water. Um, but we want to, it's a practical thing that can help you enter into the new day, right? We want to say, I'm going to live large. Can you kind of feel that when I describe it to you about living large in the spirit. There, there's just something that you can choose to. I'm going to live large by jumping in the river with what the Holy Spirit wants to take me. And I'm going to live large by, by being that, that ladder picture with the, the, the penguins. Just, let me go back to that. It was just, it's just too fun to see that contrast. I mean, the choice is yours. We watch a lot of you and that state, you know, so, and it's, it's usually because you spend too much time on the land. Okay. And we, we got to get you down into this. So live large or die small. It's a tipping point thing, right? Ascend or descend. You get soaked. If you don't get soaked, guess what? You dry out. You have your token. You've been sealed. There's no question. Nobody can take that from you, right? You're in. Just the question is, there's a lot more. And the way kingdom is moving, we have to be more and more soaked and fluid to move in all the gifts of the Spirit and all of the fruit of the Spirit. You cannot ignore one for the other. It's tradition that the church often does that. This church focuses all on the fruit. There's no supernatural. This church focuses all on the supernatural and there's very little of the fruit of the spirit. Okay. The character is often missing here and the supernatural and the wonder is missing here. And we are supposed to be moving in both. Father, thank you for what you released. I trust it was you. <laughs> Lord, I love penguins now. I just, they amaze me. And Lord, I just see a whole room full of penguins. But Lord, the waters here are deep and the waters you're taking them into are even deeper. There's rich substance there. There's great freedom. There's flow. And Lord, they can't live there all the time. They got to pop back up. But Lord, help them secure their identity as a spirit that's in a body. First things first. Let us move in that freedom. Let us have the joy of being in that place and show us how to live large in and by the Spirit to the glory of Jesus. Amen.